This is Beautiful Darkness. It's one of my favorite comics. It's gorgeous, short, full of black comedy, and a little depressing. But aren't the best books dark? Me personally, all my favorite books are real depressing. But Beautiful Darkness is way more fun than these lame old books because it has pretty pictures and you can finish it in an hour. What really puts Beautiful Darkness over the top though is its laser focus on one idea, contrast. Contrast is embedded in every part of Beautiful Darkness. Everything from the artwork to the plotline to the title involve contrasting elements. This is what makes Beautiful Darkness so re-readable. It is thoughtful, concise, and fun to read. Today, I want to talk about some of the clever ways Fabian Vellman and Karaset utilized contrast in Beautiful Darkness to discuss human nature. Synopsis and Basic Interpretation Beautiful Darkness begins on an entirely pink page. Next, we see our main character, Aurora, meeting Prince Hector for a date in a white void. There are no clear panel borders, which emphasizes the dreamlike state of the world and characters. As the ceiling caves in, panels impose themselves on the page as we enter reality. The characters desperately claw their way out of a hulking structure and begin to run. The view pulls back, and we see that the characters are escaping from the body of a dead girl. Opposite this is the title page. The small characters form a makeshift society, which quickly becomes a Lord of the Flies situation. We follow Aurora, who takes her name from the deceased girl the characters emerge from. I, and many others, interpret the little people who emerge from the girl Aurora's corpse to be portions of her personality. Plym is greedy, Zelly is vain and cruel, Hector is lustful, this girl is always scared, and Jane is independent. All these characters are relatively one-dimensional, but Aurora is different. At the onset, Aurora is always kind and helpful, thinking of others before herself. As the society formed by the little people begins to degrade, Aurora finds herself met with cruelty from people she's only tried to help. After her beloved Hector marries Zelly, Aurora leaves to make her own way in the wilderness. In the wild, Aurora meets Jane, the independent aspect of the girl Aurora, and they begin living together in the house of a hunter. This hunter is strongly implied to be the man who killed the girl Aurora at the start of the story. He's coming, he's coming, are the first words, and they're quickly followed by Aurora's death. Her body lays undisturbed for months, implying her parents don't know her location. The hunter lives completely alone in a cabin in the woods. He's shown to have a drinking problem, and he has weapons. Finally, there's this broken baby doll in his cabin, which is a pretty obvious visual hint that this guy is the murderer. Winter arrives, and with it, so does Zelly and what remains of her followers. Scared that Zelly will give away their existence to the hunter, Jane goes off to stop Zelly, despite Aurora's warnings. When Aurora meets up with Zelly, Jane is nowhere to be found, and Zelly is riding Jane's pet bird. Zelly has now stolen Aurora's lover, driven her away from civilization, and killed her only remaining friend. To top it all off, Zelly demands to move into the cabin and have Aurora be her servant. Under these straining circumstances, Aurora does something she would never have done at the start of the story. She tricks Zelly and her followers into walking into a stove before locking them inside. They burn to death in the fire the hunter uses to cook soup, which Aurora will survive off of. The final page is completely black, contrasting the first pink page. So that's the basic narrative. Now it's time to talk about visual contrast. The book takes place in a lush forest, which is portrayed in excruciating detail, in contrast with the cartoony and simplified characters we follow. 
Most panels have backgrounds which are much more detailed than the characters, and there are many distant shots to give us perspective on just how small the tiny people we follow are. The characters are unable to understand or control the world around them, and this is represented by its complexity and size. The forest is beautiful, but it's also dangerous. The characters' small size and ignorance lead to many of their deaths. A good portion of the book is devoted to contrasting cute characters with gruesome deaths. These sections are comedic in tone, but can also be somewhat disturbing. This scene of a boy trying to be fed by a bird has definitely stuck with me. Beautiful Darkness isn't the first work to contrast cartoony visuals with violence, but what sets Beautiful Darkness apart is how it perfectly executes these visuals to establish its tone and themes. This is best exemplified in the character of Aurora. Aurora's Transformation Over the course of the book, Aurora changes from a naive and optimistic friend to a nihilistic loner and murderer. She immediately establishes herself as the kind-hearted leader of the group, organizing and rationing food. Almost every other character is completely self-centered, or at least unconcerned with the group's survival. So Aurora stands out as perhaps the only character with moral intentions. This, coupled with her appealing design, especially her large eyes, makes her the natural character for the reader to latch onto and empathize with. When bad things happen to Aurora, we feel bad because we want her to succeed. And we want her to succeed because she alone wants to do the right thing. This is the standard fairy tale portrayal of the girl heroine, a put upon young girl who always does the right thing and helps others even when they are cruel to her. Aurora takes the name of the dead girl, which implies she is the closest representation of her. I see Aurora as the girl's sense of identity and self-control. One could draw ties to the character of Ralph from Lord of the Flies, who represented society, order, and goodwill. Aurora changes drastically about halfway through the story. She makes several attempts to communicate with the wildlife and achieves limited success. This rat helps Aurora gather food and is shown to be somewhat intelligent. This culminates in Aurora throwing a party for the feral animals and the members of the camp. But only two people show up, and it predictably results in complete disaster. Aurora returns to the camp to see that Hector, her prince, is marrying Zelly. Aurora walks away in shock as some children arrive with the rat from earlier, who has been captured. The rat nervously offers Aurora a berry as she begins to berate it blaming the rat for ruining her party. She then gouges the rat's eyes out with her bare hands. This is the pivot point of Aurora's character. After this, Aurora can no longer serve as a blank slate for the reader. While we can still sympathize with Aurora's struggles, this action severs us emotionally from her in a big way. Aurora was the one character to look up to and cheer for. But after this, there are no moral people left in the story. Following this, Aurora eats some of the rat's flesh and then dons its skin. The rat's skin is a symbol both of Aurora's animalistic anger as well as her regret and suppression of these instincts. The rat's skin makes Aurora appear more like an animal and visually distances us from Aurora. However, the rat skin also serves as clothing, one of the things which separates people from animals. Aurora wearing the skin shows that she has accepted her actions and made them part of herself. Clothing provides warmth and protection, and her newfound capacity for violence will be used to secure these at the conclusion. The rat skin paints Aurora both as a person and as an animal to blur the line between them. The ending. At the end of the book, Aurora has moved into the house of the man who murdered the human girl Aurora and lives there with Jane. Soon, Zelly returns and destroys the small life Aurora has made for herself. After Zelly murders Jane, Aurora completely discards her old self. She tells her first friend Plym that she has a secret spot 
which he mustn't tell Zelly about. When Plym leads Zelly and her cohorts to the spot, Aurora stands by the entrance. She has the distinct opportunity to save one of Zelly's lackeys. Instead, she shuts the door, and they are all burned alive. With this ending, Aurora completely casts aside her sense of morality. Even if you think she was morally justified in murdering several people to save herself, she deliberately ignores the opportunity to save an innocent life. The unnamed lackey that Aurora lets go to her death is the only one who tries to befriend Aurora. It seems like she obeys Zelly more out of fear than admiration, and her final action towards Aurora is to reach out to try to comfort her. Aurora chooses not to tell her the truth or drag her out of the stove. Aurora chooses to be alone. In the last words of the book, Aurora speaks to the girl's murderer. That meal you're making for us smells good, my sweet prince. This is an obvious subversion of the traditional fairy tale ending, when the prince and princess find true love. Aurora does get her happy ending in a sense. She is safe and she is alone, which both seem to be to her liking. But Aurora didn't earn this happy ending through hard work or a kind heart. She took it by any means necessary, and sometimes more than that. While she seems content at the story's conclusion, Aurora has lost the positive traits which made the audience sympathize with her in the first place. At the end of the book, Aurora has become much more similar to the murderer than to his victim. Contrast with traditional fairy tales One of the marketing blurbs for Beautiful Darkness describes it as an anti-fairy tale, and I think that's pretty accurate. Almost all fairy tales have a moral lesson, like don't trust strangers or you'll be eaten by a wolf, or don't be lazy or your house will be blown over by another wolf. Characters are either good or bad. There is the wicked stepmother or the helpful fairy godmother, and usually not much in between. In Beautiful Darkness, there is no instruction for the reader and no conception of morality. The lesson isn't be friendly, because being friendly only rewards Aurora with suffering. The lesson isn't be selfish, because the most selfish characters end up burned alive for their behavior. By the end of the book, there is no role model for the reader to emulate. As Aurora lives off of the hunter's food, he is her source of nourishment and safety. But he is also the source of all of the character's struggles. The murder he committed began the story, thrusting the characters from their fairy tale reality into the state of nature. He both destroys and provides. There is no good and evil, only shelter and wilderness, life or death. Now, don't get me wrong here. Beautiful Darkness isn't advocating that you sacrifice your humanity and take everything you can for yourself. It merely observes that, given harsh enough circumstances, you probably would. In a dog-eat-dog -dog world, evil can be necessary for survival. But that doesn't make it any more appealing. Aurora isn't portrayed as a rightful predator, assuming her role atop the food chain. She is a cornered animal put in a desperate situation. In order to survive, Aurora had to give up her personality and sense of self. It was only by accepting and assimilating her darker traits that she was able to carve out a niche to survive in. The Aurora we met on the first page would have saved this girl, but that Aurora wouldn't have had the stomach to come up with a plan in the first place, and that Aurora would be dead. The only thing that makes Aurora's existence possible is her darkness. Beautiful darkness. Thanks so much for watching. This video took a lot longer to make than I thought it would. Promise I'll have some more Udna stuff up. I know that that's, I know that's what you want. Also, a uh, hundred subscribers
Wow. <laughs>